Parenting Junkie. Welcome to the Parenting Junkie, the place to go to love parenting and for parenting from love. Today, I'm so excited to talk to you about one of my favorite topics, which is play, the playroom and toys. Um, and I'm gonna base most of what I'm saying today on simplicity parenting. As a simplicity parenting coach, I'm uh, pretty impartial to it. Um, and this is uh, Kim John Payne's work, Don't see. Um, and some of the concepts are also borrowed from Rai, um, which is the school of thought based on Magda Gerber's work and one of her biggest um, supporters and uh, a, a huge and incredible inspiration of mine is Janet Lansbury, um, who writes at JanetLansbury.com and has published uh, two wonderful books on the subject of baby and toddler. So today we're going to talk about simplifying our child's toy collection. Um, and some of the homes that some of us have or that we visit in um, have a kind of area in the home that's slightly um, troubled, that is going through a difficult time and this is often the playroom or perhaps the child's bedroom. Um, and what seems to have happened to these rooms is they've been bombarded with an insane amount of stuff, a lot of stuff, many, many toys um, of all different types and um, it's kind of, sometimes you can't really see the floor, you have to wade your way through. And this happens to the best of us because we live in a very challenging time in terms of toys. I don't think ever in the history of the world has a generation been more bombarded with advertising messages directed at our children um, and using what's called pester power, the power of ch a child pestering an adult, uh, their parent, to buy them something. We're also being bombarded with the message that there are certain toys that will develop our child. That with this toy, your child will learn to read or dance to ballet or whatever it is that it's claimed to teach them to do. Um, and so many, many toys uh, do a lot. They have a lot of functions, a lot of buttons, a lot of lights flashing, etc., etc. So when you walk into a playroom or into a, a, a bedroom of a child, you're often kind of stimulated or overstimulated one might say um, with the amount of stuff and the amount of objects there are there and the truth is that this is quite disruptive to our children and to play and um, we have all been taught through marketing messages that the notion that the more the better and that if you don't give your child this toy you're somehow depriving them and if a child has more toys they'll play for longer and somehow suddenly they'll magically be disappearing for hours on end playing in some wonderfully educational game uh, whilst you can have a bath and, and, and cook and clean and go on vacation so all of this is to say that um, these toys are slightly oversold and overpromised, to say the least, um, and sometimes they're even downright harmful to your child's focus and attention and ability to play. And let's just look at what play really needs uh, for a moment. So play um, is the child's work. Uh, play, just like you and I have our work, is the child's work. And that is where uh, research shows again and again that children develop key skills um, and it, it affects their very health, their emotional health, their academic um, health and, and their intelligence, their ability to problem solve, their ability to create social um, skills and, and, and connections because so many of those skills are practiced and practiced and developed through play. Um, and if a child is expected to play in an environment where they have so many options, such choice paralysis, let's take a metaphor for a moment and imagine you come to your desk at work, say you work at a desk, and instead of just having your laptop and maybe your phone, you now have seven laptops and three iPads and five phones and two scanners and a, and a desktop computer and, um, and a bunch of cameras and, and all sorts of different gadgets there for you. And um, you're expected to sit down and do your work. Now it might be very distracting and there might be a lot of choice paralysis going on where you're not sure which, you know, which app or which device uh, most suits this work. Um, when in fact it's not so much about the devices as much as it's about the actual work that you need to be doing. So if we take that comparison which has its flaws granted but gives you a mindset of what it means to be overstimulated to the playroom, there are a number, there's really a great list and this is based again on simplicity parenting, a great list that we can um, look at to define which toys are not going to make the cut. And one of the suggestions of Simplicity Parenting is for the parent, for you, to go into your home and collect all of the toys that you have in it. 
and you might get a little bit of a shock. You might need a few bin bags to do this. Um, and if you just collect them all, your child's bedroom, the playroom, all the knickknacks that are sitting around and you collect them all into a big pile. And now you start taking out the toys that aren't going to make the, t the cut. So here's a, a quick list of the types of toys you want to take out, give away, um, donate. One is broken toys. If it's broken, it's got to go. The next is toys that are ultra specific, that have only one purpose, that are so highly designed for a specific purpose that they can't be imagined into something else. Another type of toy to give away is toys that are active. So toys that play for your child. And Magda Gerber spoke of passive toys for active play. Uh, which means that you want toys that can't do much but can be manipulated to do a lot of things with the imagination. So that pretty much rules out almost anything with batteries, um, but not necessary. Any toy that you find really annoying should go as well. If a toy is basically an advertisement for a company, get it out. We're going to create an ad-free zone for our children. Also, if a toy is a character based on a movie, um, that's another form of advertisement, and that is another form of very specified play. Um, so that too doesn't really lend itself to your child's imagination, but it's really uh, a product of someone else's imagination. If there's a toy that's simply a passing fad that everyone has, so your child has to have, that's probably a really good indicator not to buy it. A, because you don't want to get into that snowball effect of, we have to keep up with the Joneses, and B, because very soon it will have very little interest to them. If you have more than one of the same toy, cut down. Instead of sending your child the message that one is not enough and they need multiples, cut it down and have just one. And another thing to look out for is toys that encourage aggressive play. So highly detailed guns or ammunition is a good example of something that probably is not going to encourage constructive, productive play. Another toy that you want to get rid of is anything ugly. We want to create a beautiful space that's pleasant for you and pleasing and soothing to the, eye, to the eyes of your children as well. So once you've got all of these toys out of the way, you're going to be left with the keepers. And long lasting, really high quality, simple toys. They may well be made from wood or metal or some durable um, high quality material. They don't have to be expensive, but they need to be simple and straightforward toys that a child can come and do many, many different things with. Some really great examples of these are blocks. Any simple block um, can be used in so many different ways and the imagination can really be poured into it. So that's a great example of a good open-ended toy. Another open-ended toy that works wonderfully, especially with, um, even with very young children, is our balls, all sorts of balls. Um, another great toy to go for is dressing up toys, a dressing up box where you can just keep some of your old items, some scarves, some hats, um, and this is a wonderful way to invite children into the world of imaginary play. So when you look around your playroom, you will find a far simplified environment, an environment that's actually very inviting even to you. And one of the rules to go by, again, from Simplicity Parenting is, if it takes more than one minute to clean it up, give it away, <laughs> because you want a very simple environment that is easy to clean up. A great tip um, that I use regularly is to keep a large box and rotate out some of the favorite toys. So even if it's that set of blocks, or even if they're highly simple, putting them away for a week or two at a time, or a month or two at a time, depending on your child, um, breathes new life into them. So instead of going out and buying more and more toys, you just bring out toys that they haven't seen for a while and they're once again really excited and stimulated by them. Take a moment to imagine your child's play space as a soothing environment that invites imaginative and meaningful play. If this was up your alley, please show some love. Subscribe, like and share. The Parenting Junkie